Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, my name's Matt Turner. Uh, I work at Tetrate. We do Istio service mesh kind of stuff, products and consulting. If anybody's interested in that, you can come and grab me. And yeah, today I'm going to be talking about uh, an aspect of cloud native technology, some of the stuff you can do with it, focused specifically on, on progressive delivery or continuous deployment or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I could say, yeah, 30, 30 minutes plus questions. I've got 90 slides, so we'll, we'll maybe, <laughs> maybe go a little fast. Um, I'm having technical difficulties as well. I can't read the speaker notes because the, the high DPI hasn't worked. So um, I'll just make it up. But I think I, know, I think I know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, the GoTo app does exist. Uh, feedback is, is always useful. Um, last time I gave this talk, I was basically told that I underestimated everybody. And people said, we didn't need the introduction. We're too clever for that. So, so that's 30 slides that can just go. Um, but yeah, what I want to talk about is progressive delivery in a cloud native world, which is since we are cloud native, if, if we're on our journey to cloud native, if, if our applications are starting to look cloud native, they have some of those features, then you know, what advantages do we get from that? And then what m additional tools can we add to get to some kind of cloud native nirvana, some kind of progressive delivery nirvana, which is going to look a little like this. Um, because progressive delivery is you know, a, a very hot topic at the moment. Lots of people have, have talked about it. There's books on it. I won't try to recreate that. Um, so I guess the, the question was meant to be whose you know, delivery and release process looks like this. Right, nobody then. Or you're all tired. Whose looks like this? Or maybe this? Yeah, from the 90s with these primary colors. Um, what else did I find? I googled this. Yeah, this one, I think a consultant sold this to somebody. And then you need to pay the consultant $10,000 to explain what it means. Because there's no, there's no words on it. I don't know what that means. Or you can go and talk to the agile people, right? And you get trained. You just get trained everywhere if you talk to agile people. So I think what I'm trying to say is this has always been a, a complicated, sometimes quite tedious process of getting software you know, from code into the hands of users. And, and necessarily so. There's a lot of different stages. There's a lot of checks we want to do. There's a lot of risk. But I think now we have the technology to tackle that in a different way and, and mitigate some of those issues. So how does Cloud Native enable this? So a quick tech overview. We'll, we'll power through some of these 30 slides. Um, in the beginning, there was a process, right? You wrote some code. It ended up running on Linux. Um, maybe it's compiled. Maybe it isn't. Fine. It's, it's running. Um, I won't say very much about 12-factor at all. It's kind of it's a, a bit dated now in some ways. It's kind of like this is how Heroku thinks you should write apps. But it's not wrong. Uh, there's definitely some good stuff in there, so that's that's worth a, a look. And a lot of the principles about sort of keeping config separate and isolating dependencies are, are things we're going to rely on. You run that process in Docker, right? Docker is great. You run it in a container. One thing to quickly say is um, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, twelve factor, twelve factor factor number five: strictly separate build and run. Uh, I think we use the word Docker and the word container quite loosely sometimes. To me, there's two things that are going on. So there's a container running at runtime, right? There's my, my process, my code, running in this strong isolation boundary of C groups and namespaces, if you know the underlying tech, but running in, in Docker um, in this strictly isolated way, which means we can res do resource constraints, so we can isolate its network and that kind of stuff. And then there's the container image, right? The image that this container runs from, the thing you would find on, on Docker Hub or, or any other kind of registry. And they're separate things. That image is a really powerful packaging format. It's like a language, I mean, it's tarballs under the hood, right? But it's a, this language agnostic packaging format that's got a bunch of metadata about what ports this is going to listen on and what's its entry point. But I think a container image and a, as, a, as a packaging format and a running container as like an isolation mechanism are two related but separate things, and it's useful to keep that in your head. Just briefly, you know, if I'm, if I'm writing pieces of code and I'm running them in Docker, I'm probably doing microservices. Again, there are whole books on that. Um, go watch a Sam Newman video or something. But it can just be useful to think about the broad categories of microservice you might have. Uh, and for our purposes, they might fall into sort of three. So we might have you know, one at the front that the user talks to. This is going to um, serve GraphQL or something. This is one nice API endpoint for the user that's going to hide 
the sort of you know, scatter gather the queries to a lot of other microservices. It's maybe going to orchestrate some distributed transactions. It's going to do that kind of stuff. We've then got a bunch of backends that actually do the work. You know, we write these. We have complete control of these. They all have contracts to each other. They all talk gRPC to each other. This is, this is like our world of actual business logic. And then this layer here I've got on the right, I think, is, is a powerful model that I've been using quite a lot, which is that if you've got any external system like an API in the cloud, you know, this, this cloud is just meant to be weather.com, weather go find out what the weather is, or a database or something. If you put a little microservice in front of that, then you can make them all look the same. So your backends can just talk gRPC or whatever, JSON, to no matter whether they're calling this cloud service that talks XML, right, and needs some, some, an API token handed to it, whether this is a Postgres database, you can do, especially if you use gRPC, you can do you know, bi-directional streaming here with, with all of those advantages and everything looks the same. So as far as the real business logic is concerned, it's just talking to another microservice because you put this shim in front of systems that you don't control and you didn't design. Microservices are great. You get a bunch of advantages like they can scale. I won't, uh, I won't dwell on that too much. And when you've got those services, you, you, you know, you've got a lot of them, you want redundancy, you want scalability, you need to run them on a lot of computers. Kubernetes. There you go, that's a very expensive consulting career. Um, distilled into five seconds, right? But Kubernetes, for these purposes, helps you run lots of containers across lots of computers. Cool, and it can auto-heal them and it can auto-scale them. And you can then add a service mesh. Who's heard of a service mesh as a, as a technology in Istio or something? Oh, okay, cool, that's become really popular then. So we put a network proxy alongside everything. It has its own control plane. This is Istio, for example. We can feed Istio config, and then we can make the network do smart things. And both of these together give us a bunch of metrics about what's going on, right? About uh, whether our service is crashing a lot, how much CPU and RAM it's using, and then with the network proxy in there as well, with the service mesh, we can see how many requests a second it's getting, what its latency is to respond to them, what its error rate is. And we can crunch metrics in all kinds of different ways, but you know, red metrics are the kind of the standard, I guess. You know, what is the rate of requests coming in? How many error responses did we get? And what was the latency? Because this is really the, the crux of what the user experiences and what the user wants. A lot of other stuff that you measure is a sort of a symptom, a, a cause, sorry, like an underlying reason. These, this is what's keeping your user happy. You know, did it respond quickly? And did, did it give the right answer? I was just trying to buy a, a concert ticket. And we can then start talking about service level agreements and service level objectives and service level in indicators. If you've not heard these terms, you know, pause the, pause the slide here or um, yeah, go and, uh, go and read the, the Google SRE book or something, very interesting stuff. So current deployments, what do we, what do we maybe do? So if we've got CI, right? Of course, we've all got CI, CD. It's, it's best practice. Um, continuous integration used to actually have a different meaning. It used to mean taking every branch of code. You, know, you would work on a feature on a branch, you would push that branch, and a continuous integration server was a server that continuously merged master into your branch, right? continuously rebased your branch onto main to make sure that your code integrated with the code that everybody else was working on and everybody else was shipping to, to catch integration issues up front, especially when you had a million lines of code because all of your microservices were actually just one monolith. That's what continuous integration used to mean. These days, people just mean, I, I mention that because it's kind of come back with microservices, right? How many times have you deployed one microservice that relied on a new API from another one or something, or, or somebody else changed their API and you then couldn't call it, and you hadn't caught that, that integration sequence correctly? But nowadays, it basically means continuous build, right? Build, test, lint all the time. Great. So deployment. I've done my continuous integration. I've got my, my build artifact. I then want to deploy it, right? But what does that mean? It probably means taking my piece of software and running it, right? Vaguely. So continuous deployment is de deploying it continuously. Every time there's a new build, because this is automated, deploying that piece of software. But when we start to talk about progressive delivery, we maybe have to redefine the terms a little bit. So if we say that release is, we, def we can define this term release, and we say that this is exposing a piece of software to users, right? Because that's where the risk really is. That's where the value is. That's where we make money, getting these new features to users. And that's where the risk is, because the software might be broken. 
So if we use this word release to mean exposing a piece of software to users, or you can look at it the other way around, exposing users to a piece of software, then what would continuous release be? Well, continuous release would be exposing every new deployment to these users. Every time we run a piece of software, you know, the users are going to be accessing it. So every new build gets exposed to all of the users. Because that's based on this assumption. It does my deployment, does running the software, the new version, mean releasing it, mean users accessing it and taking that risk? Usually it does. Is spoiler alert. I think that's going to be one of the main the main, main principles. Usually it does, but it doesn't have to because we have a bunch of technology that I'll show you that means we can decouple these two stages. So we can then continuously build and continuously deploy, start running every new version, but not necessarily expose it to users. And that's got a bunch of advantages that I will go through. Well, we're halfway through already. Um, so I've got a picture to make this easier, right? The build process, we do a Git, we, we take some code, we commit it to, to Git, some CI system comes along, uh, and you know, we've got the output, so this is, this is probably a container image, because it's a really nice packaging format, ends up in some registry, Docker Hub or, or something else. The contract of this is that every new commit, every new merge to main, produces a container image, pushes it to the registry. And this does the bottom of that, like the agile testing pyramid, if you want. Right? We lint, we compile. If you're in a compiled language, you can catch an awful lot of errors by writing Rust and letting the, the type checker and the borrow checker and the lifetime checker find all classes of errors. If you're using JavaScript, good luck. But you might, get, you might have some unit tests. you know. And then deployment is very separate. So I've drawn this big line. So what we've got here is a user sitting behind a sort of you know, load balancer API gateway. We've got a separate Git repo. So we're doing GitOps, I guess. Everybody familiar with the sort of basic GitOps principles of, yeah, cool, no sort of shaking heads. Um, so we've got a repo full of YAMLs or whatever that describe what should be running. We've got a little you know, sync operator. So we've got a couple of pods running in, in Kubernetes. We can add more operators, more automation is always good. We can add more. So this watches the container registry and says every time there's a new image, you need to update this and, and, and run it. So this is continuous deployment, but sort of in the roundabout way because we're doing GitOps. So user is sitting there. All of their requests are going to our current version. Great. If I do a new Git commit, new build, all passes the tests, ends up in the container registry, this thing notices there's a new version of software updates the description in here to say, hey, the new version should be running. And then this thing says, oh, yeah, the new version should be running. So it runs it. Now when the user makes a request on a naive system, you know, well, there's new endpoints now behind our load balancer. So the traffic gets split, right? Goes to both of them. This is the risky part. This, this build is not risky. This deployment, getting this running is not risky. This is risky. Sending user traffic to it is risky. So we can introduce yet more automation, yet another operator that will notice that all of this is going on and reprogram that load balancer on the fly and say, no, just keep the user traffic on the known good version for now, please. Why do we want to do that? This is kind of the crux of things. Why do we want to do that? Well, firstly, these are running. These have been deployed. Why do I keep saying we wanted to continuous to deploy? These are running, and they're running in production. Right, so they can access the production database. They are subject to production resource constraints. They're reading production configuration files. I worked somewhere once that had an outage because somebody changed the config file format and changed the software that read it, and they got deployed. Out, like A new thing started, and it's just crash looped. It just sat there. It was fine in staging, which is, of course, exactly the same as prod. But when it got to prod, it just kept crashing because the config file looked wrong. So running this stuff, just, just even seeing if, it's, if it starts in prod can be useful. And having it sitting here running in prod is, is useful. Because what this magic low balancer network operator can do is, OK, so the, con yeah, the contract of that is you see a new image, you deploy it to prod, doesn't get any user traffic. So, so why? What could we start to do? What's different? Well, this thing can tell the load balancer that, sure, user traffic goes to v1. But v2 it is available, right? It's sitting there. It is deployed. It's running. It's in production. So if a tester comes along and they set something like a header, or they're on a well-known machine, well, their traffic can go to the new one. So they can start doing it. You can do manual testing. You can do you know, user acceptance testing or whatever. You just opt into the new version of the service. And this is much better than doing it in a test environment or a staging environment, 
because A, you don't have to pay for a complete copy of your environment. B, it is going to be the same because it, it is prod, right? As I say, prod data is, is available, prod config is available, other prod services are available to talk to. So that's your continuous integration, right? When this thing is under test, you know it's being tested against the latest version of every other service because of course it is, it's in prod, right? That's what's running. And this, this can be automated, you know, the, these agents can have the ability to kick off some kind of bot that will replay, you know, um, uh, replay regression test cases and that kind of stuff. This can be a load test, right? This can be a big fat pipe of stuff because remember those red metrics, you may have added your new feature, perfectly functional, but you slowed everything down by five times, right? So when you hit it with a lot of load, the users are gonna have the right answer, but an unacceptably slow experience. That's also a, a criterion that says, don't release. Yeah, I think I've gone over most of that. Does it even start? It's there for manual testing. It's there for integration testing with all the other microservices. It's there for end-to-end -end testing. And then you can look at, and you can look at non-functional stuff as well, right? It, it, it is a fail. It is a, it is a no release if your performance isn't within the SLO. Uh, I might skip this. Otherwise, we're not going to get, you're not going to see me fail to run a demo, um, which is way more fun than my slides. Uh, yeah, that's fiddly. That's why we're going to skip it. Um, so other things this can do, right? We, so we've, we've done some manual testing. We've opted into V2. We can now start to send the user traffic here as well. But this arrow only points one way, right? User requests go here. Responses don't go to the user because the responses might be wrong. But in the face of these user requests, we can see what this does with user requests. Like, does it crash? Does it slow down? Um, we can try to do all the testing we want before this, right? We can lint and we can, we can unit test and we can do everything we want. But the reason we test in prod is nothing will ever be as crazy a test case as a user, right? Nothing. I was doing a, an un, one of the unscripted, um, go-to unscripted things with Eric Johnson this morning. We'd had quite a lot of coffee and, we, and I was just like, yeah. Um, you know, user requests are regression cases you haven't discovered yet. So, so this is what this is about, right? You've, you've replayed all the bad traffic from before, but maybe there's, hey, new kinds of bad traffic. So you can, you can feed it in, but not get a response because, you know, again, you're not taking the risk. You haven't released if the user isn't exposed to this software. The software is exposed to the user in this case, actually, but the user isn't exposed to the software. So maybe I need to go and rewrite that earlier slide. And as I say, we can see what it's doing. We can see what its responses look like. We can, yeah, we can see what its responses look like. You know, is there an error rate in there? We can even diff the two. If you didn't think you'd made a functional change, or if you didn't think you touched certain endpoints, then you can even see if it's giving the, the same answer as the previous version. All this software kind of exists. It's, it's all possible. So yeah, we're now at the stage that it's running in prod, but it's invisible to those users. So release the actual act of releasing, of exposing users to software. So the next thing this operator can do, and all the previous stages, right, are about getting as much confidence as possible that this is going to work in prod, you know, known regression cases, load tests, whatever, e everything the manual testers can think of. But at some point, you've got to open the floodgates. But you don't open the floodgates all the way. So we can now start sending a little bit, a little bit of user traffic right, to the new version, a, a canary deployment, if you want. So we can send 1% in, see what happens, see if everything's OK. You know, the user gets the response. And you can watch the metrics of everything as you do that. And yeah, you see this operator, this, this automated bot is watching the metrics, because this can also all be automated. And this, this agent will continue to ramp that traffic, continue to move it slowly across, and just keep an eye on everything, make sure the performance doesn't hockey stick at a certain load or level or whatever. And it can do it completely automatically if you, if you tell it enough about the software, right? If you tell it what good is meant to look like and what bad looks like, then it can make the decisions that you can and we can just ramp the, the traffic across um, until you know, most or all of it goes, goes to the new version. Well, I got there. Let's see it. I think the point of this, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to say, really, is that I think th that is a sort of setup that everybody can aim for. I think, you know, that's my sort of thesis to you, is I think this is a good way to do things. I think this is um, a nice north star to be at. Everything's automated, everything's gradual, everything hopefully has a, like, a much reduced risk. If we start off 
if we, if we are cloud native, right, if everything is a, is a cloudy technology, we don't have, you know, like physical on-premise load balancers or anything, then most of us are probably some way along that technological journey to, you know, there's nothing stopping us doing this. And actually all the tech to do all of this stuff exists. All of those agents that I showed exist. I'm going to demo some of them now. The stuff to diff that traffic, you know, that exists. I haven't actually integrated it into this demo. I, I struggle to make it work. You know, there's not all of these tools are super mature yet. I couldn't get one talking to the other, but it's all possible. I'm going to give it another go. Uh, and if that doesn't work, I'm going to write another diff agent. But it's all, it's all doable. So what I wanted to do is show you that to hopefully reinforce the point and to also just show you that I'm not lying because it always it always feels better if you've seen it I guess so this may not be smooth oh it's not letting me even move my desktop across you see uh, right what are we going to do first we are going to Oh, I need to run one more thing. So I've got... Nope, I need to run another couple of things. You saw the diagram, right? This is a this is a complicated system here. This is not like how to this is not how to write hello world in, in Go. Um, so bear, bear with me. Even the error message is broken. <laughs> that tells you something. Oh, what's wrong with my error message? Okay, okay, okay. So the Kubernetes cluster running Istio service mesh, running all of the other agents. Um, the thing to look at here actually is this piece of software called Blue Green. Really simple little blue green thing. It literally gives you a web page that's either blue or green. Uh, the image is 300k. That's that's what's nice about it. Um, so you can see it's running version one. And in fact, you might have just noticed that we have blue green, and there's now this blue green primary because the that continuous deployment agent is getting itself ready to start shifting traffic. So it actually runs two versions of V1 to kind of just be be ready to go. Uh, and it's it's telling Kubernetes this one actually just shouldn't get any traffic yet. Um, so we're running V1, great, because V1, I need refreshing, that's going to give the game away. Oh, even the Wi-Fi's gone, come on, this isn't fair. There we go. V1, V1 is the only version that exists, right? So V1 is the version that's running. one piece of terminal we'll see. Build and push version one, zero, one. <laughs> Pushed. So now, so I've done some work, I've written some code, I've built the container image, I've pushed the container image. So in our container registry, we've now got a one, zero, one. All of these things poll sort of every minute so that we don't get rate limited by Docker Hub or anything else. So I'm just going to have to stall for a little bit while this happens. Um, but what's going to happen is one of those uh, agents will hopefully notice that we've got the 101 image. You know, a developer has, and you can shift more of the risk management left in your process, right? So you know, if this were a real company, I'd have probably, I'd have written my code I'd have pushed it to a branch. I'd have it only have got into main, you know, subject to passing tests, subject to code review. Um, so you know, and the merge into main says it's kind of ready to go. It's ready to be deployed, and then everything else is, you know, as soon as that PR is approved, everything else is automated from there right through the build and through the deployment. And we should be seeing the the deployment start part of that now. Uh, as I say, it'll take it'll take a little while. Um, what I might do is switch over to the slide. So the way I've built this is I've just put some product logos in in place of those little um, little sort of controller icons I had. I'm showing GitHub actions for for CD. Doesn't I mean I've got a make file right? But it could be pick, sorry CI pick a CI system. Um, I'm using 
weave flux as the GitOps operator. So this is the thing that watches the image registry and actually takes what's in Git and pushes it out. So what, what we're waiting for, I've pushed the new image to Docker Hub. We're waiting for one part of Flux to notice that it's there and actually do a commit into the Git repo that describes deployments. And then another part of Flux will notice the commit into Git and actually go and run these pods. This is all super, super decoupled, which means it's sort of extensible at every point. Um, oh, it's there. There we go. Right, 101. So 101 is now running. All I did was, was push a container image. And it's at, you'll notice we've got 101 and 100 running because this last piece of the puzzle, Flagger, which is this progressive de deployment operator, has kicked in and gone, OK, wait, I'm going to keep a copy of 100 running because I know that's good. And it's now going to be moving the traffic between this one. And it'll, it'll run any sort of automated test we asked it to on this. This is isolated. And I've got it set to automatically start rolling traffic across. If you're in an organization that still needs approval, if, if for whatever political reason, you still need a human to tick a box at some point, you can let all of this run. It can get to this stage. You can have 101 you know, running in prod, ready for manual test if you set that header, ready for everything. But it won't. You can, you can configure Flagger to not start rolling the user traffic across until some human with an expensive job title has pressed a button. Like You can do that. That's fine. Uh, and it can be a visual thing. So, so that, that's why that's hanging around. I've actually got it. I've, I've said I trust the process, and I want it to start rolling traffic over. Uh, and what we'll see. But why is there zero ports for the Kubernetes? Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Very absurd. There's, so there's, Kubernetes is saying zero pods are ready because the service mesh has been told to reject all the traffic coming into it, basically. So it's, it's lowered. That's how we actually, that's the mechanism it uses under the hood to actually stop the traffic flowing, is to just lower the readiness probe, because it's still in that automated testing phase. But no, it's a good question. Um, so if we actually, so this is my GitOps repo. My, this is the repo full of YAML files that are getting deployed by Flux. And we should, see, yeah, three minutes ago, there was a commit to the deployment, because this thing says 101. And what happened was, I tested this demo a few times. You can't be too careful. Um, what happened was, flux CD bot changed the zero to the one, right? And we've just about got time. I can push. Maybe I do some more work, and I push one one zero. We've now got one one zero on Docker Hub. So we won't wait because we don't really have time. What's going to happen here is, is this won't happen. It'll stay on 101. And the reason for that is checked in. I have, oh no, wait, I'm on history view. I've got this image policy that says, yeah, what? What risks am I prepared to take? What versions of these software do I think is good to be released? Right? It's deployed. 110 will be there. Do all the tests against it you want. Observe it. But it's, we're not happy to start canary releases to it because this, my policy says some senior manager you know, hasn't signed off that new feature branch. And marketing doesn't want these features to get in front of users yet because that's a perfectly valid business decision right? that's not technical. So tech can carry on doing their things. 110 will be running in prod. But it won't be. It won't be there. Um, and keeping this as graphical as possible, you can maybe teach a you know product owner or somebody to to do this. That's not meant to be me being mean. Um, but you know, we for these processes to work in a, in a business, the the non technical people who are involved in them have to be able to understand what's going on and use the tools, right? So saying get a command line, type git commit, git push, it's just not going to work. It's not their job. Um, but you could build a dashboard in front of this. You could do something else, right? I'm just trying to keep it fairly visible. Um, risk. Yes, please. Commit. And then we might see it. We might not. Uh, I promise you what will happen is we'll see, we'll see 110 there, and it'll start to come across. Um, because that, you know, that image is now being allowed in by, by the policy. Um, and if at any point any of these images started returning 500s over the levels we've committed, because the all the config for that is in this big old file. 
So this is, this is the configuration for that continuous deployment agent. Um, you know, what's the, how many times do we sort of reach, like, how often do we, what's the moving average window on the analysis? How many times is it allowed to fail before I think it's bad? You know, where do we, where are the tra where are the two ends of the traffic sliders? Do we, you know, s stop if we're gating it? If we've got a manual gate, where do we stop? Um, you know, what does success look like? It looks like over a sliding minute, you know, 99% um, non-500 responses. So all of this stuff is all of this stuff is configurable. So that's basically it. Where did I put my slides? Yep, so that's what I sh just showed. Uh, it's all available today. I mean, all of that stuff is available and works. Didn't take me too long to knock that demo together. Even more advanced stuff, um, like sort of diffing traffic and uh, like mirroring traffic and re replaying stuff, like all of that exists, but is, is more fiddly to set up. You'll be, you know, this is kind of, this is DevOps, right? This is download somebody else's software and run it territory. If you want to go to the next level, that's write your own software territory, which may or may not be something you've got the time to do. Um, I should just say I'm not shilling, other, other products are available. You can, you can replace all of those with, you know, at least this set of stuff um, and maybe others. And I think, for my, uh, nah. I think we can ask a question about that if we want. I think for my 30 minutes, that was probably all I was going to say. Thanks very much. <laughs>